Hello, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Dave Chancellor, and I'll be your host today. Uh, for this webinar, we're going to be hearing about federal student loan policy and what can be done to improve it. And it's a real pleasure to have Karen Dynan here to talk with us today about this. Um, professor Dynan is a professor of the practice of economics at Harvard University and was the Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the U.S. Treasury Department from 2013 to 2017. And she'll talk more about her background in just a bit. But uh, Karen, thanks for being here today. Thanks, Dave. I'm delighted to be here. Okay. Yeah, it's great to have you. So uh, I also want to thank the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation uh, for their support of this webinar series. That said, any positions expressed in this webinar are not necessarily those of ASPE, any other agency of the federal government, or the Institute for Research on Poverty. Uh, so with that, uh, Karen, thanks again for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to you now. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so, uh, so let's get started. Um, so let me start by um, telling you how it is I um, came to thinking about student loans. Uh, before I worked at Harvard, uh, I served as Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the U.S. Treasury Department from 2013 until early 2017. And um, when I was at Treasury, it was part of my job to participate in the White House discussions around student loan policy. So I was kind of helping to shape that policy along with counterparts across the administration. Um, and among the issues that we worked on are things like the college scorecard, the gainful employment rule, the income-driven repayment plans for student loans, um, and we also developed um, what's called a risk-sharing proposal. I'm going to um, talk about all these things as I go on with my presentation. Um, and, uh, you know, during the talk, I'm going to draw off my own experience, uh, but I'm also going to talk about work that was done by some of my former colleagues from Treasury, want to make sure uh, they get some credit, I'll reference their work, as well as some uh, really important academic research that has been done in the last few years. Okay, so um, anyway, student loans, uh, when I was in the administration, uh, they were a source of concern. And uh, they continue to be a source of concern. Uh, this uh, slide just shows you a screenshot from an article talking about um, what people sometimes call the student loan crisis. Um, but I'm sure you've seen many stories um, like this in the news. And um, we're also starting to hear, of course, more news around um, kind of the presidential candidates and uh, their plans for student loans. So, so it's a very kind of relevant topic right now in the policy world. In terms of um, how I'm going to structure my talk, I'm going to start you out with some background on the federal student loan program. Um, and one thing I'm going to want you to take away is that the, the program is an important program and it serves um, many students well. I wouldn't characterize it as generally, um, generally broken. But I would say there are important specific areas of concern. So I'm going to spend the next chunk of my talk talking about kind of what those concerns are. And then I'll kind of complete the talk with a discussion of how we can uh, improve policy so as to address these concerns. OK, so um, let's start with some background on the Federal Student Loan Program. Um, the program uh, was established by the Higher Education Act of um, 1965. It's been altered over time, typically with reauthorizations of the act. The act was last reauthorized in 2008. It tends to get reauthorized every four or five years. So uh, there has been uh, discussion uh, in recent years about a reauthorization, although that has not happened, but that does kind of um, uh, kind of raise the possibility that we can make uh, some of the changes that I'm going to talk about in my talk. Um, the program covers about 90% of new student borrowing. Uh, so it's, it's most of uh, student debt that's out there. Also, there is a little bit of student debt that is um, kind of privately issued student debt. Uh, the stock of student debt outstanding at the end of 2018, it was uh, $1.5 trillion, so a big number. Uh, new borrowing over the 2017 to 2018 school year was $94 billion. 
So this was about 60% uh, of total federal higher education aid. Uh, so, so loans was, were about 60% uh, with the remainder being um, kind of uh, going towards things like grants. Uh, interest rates on student loans, they're set by Congress, so they can change over time. Uh, currently, uh, interest rates on new loans are between 5 and 8%, depending on the type of loan. Uh, for those of you who know about loan markets, that's uh, not a bad interest rate when you're talking about um, kind of a large amount of unsecured debt. And then a really key feature of the student loan program is that um, there's no um, underwriting, as we traditionally think about it, in most cases. So your eligibility is determined by enrollment at an accredited institution, but once you're enrolled at that institution, you are eligible, even if you come from uh, kind of a poor background. Uh, you know, most 18-year-olds don't have much of a credit record, but even if you have no credit record or you have a credit record that's not so good, uh, your eligibility for the basic program is going to be determined by enrollment alone, and that turns out to be really important to mobility because uh, what we're trying to do with this program is um, enable students from uh, kind of underserved backgrounds to be able to access higher ed. Um, this slide shows you uh, student loan limits. These are um, limits on kind of the most basic type of direct student loan. So if you walked into, uh, if you were going to get some higher ed, the first um, uh, loan that you would get would have uh, this sort of limit on it. And you can see that for um, dependent undergrads, uh, the limits are something between uh, five and $8,000 a year. For um, undergrads who are not uh, dependent, who are independent, uh, they're somewhat higher. And you can see uh, that for um, graduate education, you can see there's an annual limit of just over 20000 uh, and kind of a total cap on the amount you can borrow of around 140000 on these types of student loans. Um, there is another part of the student loan program, which is called uh, the PLUS program. Uh, and these PLUS loans, uh, which are available to parents and graduate students who basically need more aid, the kind of basic student loans won't cover all of their expenses, these loans do not have what we think about as traditional limits. And I raise this because it's going to become important later in my talk. Um, but basically, uh, this is just a screenshot from the Department of Education website, um, but what you can see here is um, kind of the third bullet that I've circled says that the, the maximum loan you can receive is uh, basically determined by the cost of attendance at the school that you're going to. Um, so, so basically, the limit is just determined by what the school, as long as it's participating in the program, it's accredited to participate in the uh, program, uh, decides to um, charge. Okay, so um, talk a little bit about repayment. Uh, the standard repayment period on student loans is um, 10 years. If you have a larger loan, it might have a kind of longer term. Um, you get a little grace period after you graduate, six months. Uh, before you need to start repaying. And then you're in default uh, if you don't pay the loan, if you end up being more than 270 days late. And uh, bad things happen when you default on your student loans. So for example, uh, it hurts your credit score, uh, interest continues to accumulate on the loan, uh, you are at risk of debt collectors coming after you, uh, you're, risk, you're at risk of wage garnishment. You're at risk of having your tax refund taken away and applied towards your debt. Okay, so but um, kind of you don't necessarily have to default if you are struggling to make your uh, payments. Uh, you uh, you can uh, normally contact your servicer, and uh, you know if you can uh, document your hardship, the servicer may grant you forbearance or put you in deferral so you don't have to make those payments while you're in hardship. There is also um, an important piece of the student loan program which is uh, known as the income-driven repayment plans. Uh, so your servicer may put you in one of these plans 
Uh, so this plan is designed for someone whose uh, income is not high enough to make their regular payment. And basically, it limits uh, a person's monthly payment to a given fraction of his or her income. So typically, it's about 10%. And then if you're in the program uh, uh, and you haven't uh, kind of been able to pay off your entire loan after 20 to 25 years of making these payments, uh, it will forgive the remaining balance. Okay. I have uh, kind of much more to come on this topic. Um, I'm going to give you some facts and figures now on student debt. So this slide is just showing you growth in total outstanding student debt over time. Uh, and what you can see is that student debt has risen sharply. Uh, there's been a six-fold increase in outstanding debt over the past 15 years uh, due to um, several factors, including a surge in college, college enrollments and increases in tuition levels. Uh, and what you can see is that uh, student loans have basically kind of just grown higher and higher and higher. Uh, it was kind of the one type of household loan that did not kind of slow down in the period after the financial crisis. Um, the share of households with student debt has also risen sharply. So uh, this graph shows you some data from the Survey of Consumer Finances uh, that's just showing you um, the sh how the share of households uh, that have some or that are reporting some student debt has evolved over time. And what you can see, the last survey, uh, which is uh, shown with this bar, uh, about 22% of households had some student debt in 2016, up from uh, about kind of 9% in the late 1980s. Um, so not only has there been a share, an increase in the share of borrowers who have student debt, there's also kind of much more debt per borrowing household. So this graph is from the same data set, and what it's showing you is kind of median debt per household that was borrowing. And you can see here, big growth over the years. So in 2016, the last survey, um, the median household had $19,000 worth of student debt. So that's um, up almost four times from kind of the level that the median bar had in 1989. Okay, so um, one, one interesting thing that I think it's, uh, that you can look at in these data is uh, kind of patterns for different age groups. And so that's what this graph is showing you. Uh, what I've got is um, kind of this, this left group of bars is households with a head that's under the age of 35. Then in the middle group, it's households with heads that are between 35 and 44. And then this last grouping is households uh, between 45 and 54. Okay, And the different bars um, correspond to uh, kind of surveys over time. And uh, what you see is that um, kind of about close to half of all um, kind of younger households have student debt at this, at this point. So that's a lot of households. Um, but it's also interesting to look at these patterns uh, for households who are uh, later in life. So at this point, between 20 and 30,000, sorry, between 20% and 30% of households in their late 40s and early 50s have student debt, uh, which is, when you think about it, a kind of a material share of households, and I think a concern when you consider the fact that um, these households are in the years really where they should be focused on getting, you know, doing a lot of retirement saving. Okay, so um, those were numbers on uh, kind of the stock of student debt. Let me talk for a minute about kind of annual borrowing, so kind of the new flow of uh, student loan debt, that, that, you know, people who are taking out loans. And what I'm showing you in this picture on the kind of right panel, uh, this is new borrowing uh, total for the whole country amongst undergraduates, okay? And what you see here is that uh, new borrowing kind of rose sharply uh, for between 2002, you know, basically until 2012, uh, and then peaked in those years and has come down since, but it's still a good bit higher than it was in 2002. Um, basically, uh, the 2012 peak was in a period where the economy was still really weak, 
and um, households were struggling to make ends meet. And moreover, because joblessness was high, a lot of people were going back to school. So, um, so that's why you had this kind of peak then, and things are kind of lower now, though still kind of high by the kind of historical range of these numbers. Um, on the right over here, I have uh, numbers on uh, new borrowing by graduate students. And what you can see here is that basically there has been uh, kind of a, a big increase for this series as well, and this series has not come down uh, in recent years as the economy has strengthened. Let me talk now um, just a little bit about um, problems that people have uh, making their payments. So I'm going to start you out by showing you what's called uh, cohort default rates. Okay, so so what these are? These are two-year cohort default rates, and uh, for example, this. this this rightmost bar in the graph um, is showing you uh, for students who graduated from their program uh, that uh, within two years of graduating, so for this rightmost bar would be by 2014, um, almost 10% of them were in uh, default. Okay, so um, you know the. You can't, it's hard to tell from the scale in this graph, but this is kind of a big increase. Uh, it was 4% in the early 2000s, so it's an increase of about two and a half fold, and 10% is not a small number. Um, the reason I have it on, uh, the reason I have this, uh, this scale on the graph is that I also wanted to show you the numbers for uh, students who did not graduate from their program, and uh, as some of you may already know, no, the numbers are much worse for people who don't graduate. So you can see right the most recent numbers on these graphs, and uh, they are not all that recent, but this is the best I could get from the College Board. Um, but you can see that close to a quarter of students who did not graduate uh, from the people who left school in 2012 uh, were in default uh, within two years, um, down from its peak. Uh, during the recession, it's still a very high number. Okay, and uh, so there has been this net rise. Uh, research um, attributes much of the rise in these cohort default rates to the recession, um, but also a change in what, what the research calls a, the composition of borrowers. I'm going to talk about this more. Um, when, they, when people talk about the composition of borrowers, uh, the change was really driven uh, by a change in the higher ed industry. Uh, and I'll come back to that, that point in a few minutes. Okay. Um, just want to make the point before we leave this section that this student loan program we have, it's, it's generally a good program uh, and it's generally desirable to have. Uh, it's essential for economic mobility given the lack of collateral and asymmetric information problems, the loan supply from the private market alone would be much too low to be sending um, people to college. Um, there's some good research out of the Brookings Institution by Ron Haskins that kind of uh, speaks to just how important it is to get kind of vulnerable uh, uh, individuals uh, into higher ed programs. Uh, so Haskins documented that for children who are born in the bottom quintile of the income distribution, 41% um, of the, those who received a college degree ended up in the top part of the income distribution, the top 40%, compared to only 14% of those who did not get their college degree. So very important to get that college degree, and the student loans are important to getting that college degree. Um, it is true that individuals are taking on more debt. I'm showing you that. Um, but I will remind you that the returns to a college degree have increased substantially over the decades. So there are several good papers that I'm citing here that shows that even accounting for this higher level of student loans, the net return on education is still typically, for the typical student, higher than that on other investments. Okay? I'll talk in a minute about who, who isn't getting that return. Okay. And the very last piece of background I want to offer on the student loan program is that um, we have seen this, this big growth. It's not likely to uh, result in another you know, 2007 to 2008 style financial crisis. Um, 
so, you know, several considerations uh, to think about here. So first of all, we're talking about much less debt. Uh, you know, there's $1.5 trillion of outstanding student debt versus uh, $10 trillion of kind of mortgage debt, not to mention all the debt that was associated with all these derivative uh, mortgage-related products. Um, the payment problems with student loans, um, although they are bad, they're less widespread amongst borrowers than was mortgage distress. Uh, and then because most student loans are government loans, um, large-scale default is not going to hurt private financial institutions and take down the financial system the way uh, that uh, we saw in the 2007-2008 uh, financial crisis. It doesn't mean it's not going to hurt the, the students who are affected. Of course, it will hurt them, and it's also going to hurt taxpayers if, uh, if, if all these loans default and the, and the taxpayers have to pay that cost. Okay? Um, you know, all that said, there are important concerns that can be addressed through better policy. And I want to take the next part of the talk and basically get to those concerns. Okay? So the first um, concern I want to talk about is the fact that default rates, they understate borrower strugglers, borrower struggles. In fact, I would describe them as grossly understating the strugglers of borrowers. Um, so as I told you previously, remember, you can be in default if you have trouble paying your student loans. But it's also the case that borrowers facing hardship may be put into deferment or forbearance. Let me show you a graph here. This is basically uh, a graph that shows the repayment status of uh, the federal student loan portfolio, both in terms of borrowers and in terms of dollars. But um, let's see, you can see, uh, for example, here that something like 17% of borrowers were in default, okay? But then we also have people who are struggling who are in forbearance and in deferment, okay? So um, to kind of think about this right, you probably don't want to think about these, um, the students who are in school or in their grace period because they're not even supposed to be uh, you know, paying back their student loans. What you want to look at is kind of this group of people who are in default, forbearance, and deferment as a share of um, all the people who are supposed to be repaying their loans. And when you do that calculation, you find that 42% of the borrowers, 42% of the borrowers who should be repaying their loans are in default, for forbearance, or deferment. So that's a pretty striking number. Okay? And of course, that's not all. Because remember, I told you before, if you're struggling, you might also go into an income-driven repayment program. So about a fifth of borrowers, representing about two-fifths of balances, they're in uh, some sort of income-driven repayment plan. So we can also think about them as borrowers who are struggling. Okay? Um, and these income-driven repayment plans, you know, it's good that they allow the borrowers to avoid the negative consequences of default. Okay? But remember, at the end of the day, these borrowers still have to pay off their loans. So they're extending their loans, they're spending, they're spending their term, sorry, and paying more interest on their loans. Okay, so given that limitation of default rates, um, it's important to look at um, repayment rates as well as default rates. Okay, so if you think about it, those borrowers who are struggling, they're not paying back their loans. They're either in default, forbearance, or deferral, or maybe they're in an income-driven repayment program. A really relevant question is going to be, well, how many borrowers are actually making progress paying down their loans? And that's what a repayment rate will tell you. Okay? So if you just look at this um, kind of chart I have here, it's basically data from the New York Fed, and it's telling you the percent of borrowers that are current on their loans. Um, so they're, they're they're current on their loans, but they have the same or higher balance than in the previous quarter. Okay, and the kind of takeaway here is that 47.5% of borrowers, so almost half of borrowers, uh, basically they're not showing up as having a problem with their loan, okay, but they're also not making progress paying down their loan. Okay, and the modest improvement that I showed you in, in cohort default rates since their peak in 2010, that's actually coincided with a rise, okay, that you can see on this, this chart here, a rise in the share of the students who are not 
showing up as in default, but also not making progress paying down their loans. Um, so, you know, that's, this is a kind of the standard indicators of distress. Um, there is some research that I, that I want to mention that tries to look beyond financial distress, um, you know, to assess the effects of student loans. And I can come back to this in Q&A if people are interested. Uh, but basically, there's some research on student loans and uh, home ownership rates. Do they delay home ownership rates? Uh, there's student loans and auto ownership rates. Um, so there's some research that tries to get at whether student loans are kind of impairing these other outcomes. Um, the comment I want to make now is that as you're looking at this research, um, you need to understand how to interpret it. Most of these studies are just basically looking at um, kind of former college students with, and with loans and comparing them to those without loans. Okay? So, um, this is the situation where, you know, the, the student loan kind of ferry arrives on your doorstep and they wave their wand and your student loans disappear, but you get to keep your college education, okay? So, um, you yeah, know, that is one kind of interesting question to ask, um, but, um, you know, a lot of people think that kind of, you know, an, an even more interesting question is, um, kind of, well, if you think to get rid of the student loans, you have to get rid of the student loan program, okay? Then you're going to have these people who don't have debt, but they also don't have a college degree. And that's not going to be good for their probability of home ownership either. So kind of just bottom line with this research, you just need to be kind of careful when you're interpreting it. Okay. Um, second concern I want to talk a little bit about is for-profit colleges. Okay, so just to start you off with some background, um, they're kind of a smallest share when it, when it comes to enrollment, uh, but the enrollment share has risen. It uh, kind of rose from 4% in the late 1990s to a peak of more than 11% in 2010, has since come back down to 7%. Okay, the growth that we have seen has been um, kind of concentrated in online institutions and kind of the big chains that you probably have uh, heard about. Okay, and one thing I want to make really clear is that they do have some valuable features. So they, um, they serve a more disadvantaged population. Okay, there's been research documenting that uh, people who attended for-profit uh, institutions have lower parent income. They have a higher age at entry. They're more likely to be first generation. Okay, so they serve a more disadvantaged population. They're quicker to innovate. Um, they provide education and training in some fields that aren't served by other types of higher ed institutions. And if you want to kind of see a thoughtful discussion of the advantages as well as the disadvantages of um, the for profits, I do recommend this paper by my colleagues uh, David Deming, Claudia Golden, and Larry Katz. Uh, which uh, kind of uh, kind of talks through those issues. Okay, so some valuable features. Okay, but there are some serious concerns about uh, predatory practices, um, high tuition. Okay, and a related run up in debt, and low value added from these uh, institutions. Certainly not all of them, but um, some of them for sure. Um, to give you a sense of kind of just how important they are to, to the student loan picture, um, I'd like to use this uh, screenshot. It's from a study that um, Looney and Yanellis did for Brookings a few years back. But basically what I'm showing you is a list of the top 25 colleges in terms of how much student debt they accounted for. On the left, it's um, kind of the numbers for 2000. On the right, it's the numbers for 2014. Okay. So what I want you to notice about this graph is a couple of things, okay? So first of all, I want you to notice the big kind of increase in the amounts, okay? So look at this 2.2, which was associated with New York, 2.2 billion, which was associated with New York University in 2000. That was the top school in terms of the aggregate amount of student debt, okay? By 2014, the largest uh, uh, or the, the biggest student borrowing institution was the University of Phoenix. And uh, their number was uh, almost $36 billion. Okay, so 
huge increase in the amounts. Okay, but the other thing I want to notice you to notice is the huge rise in for-profit profit representation on the list. So the the schools I've highlighted in yellow, those are the for-profit schools. You can see that there was one of them on the list for the year 2000, and uh, by uh, 2014 they accounted for more than half the schools. Okay. Um, so there's been a research, uh, or big, there's been a growing uh, line of research on uh, kind of for-profit schools and outcomes, particularly with regard to student debt. So uh, what I'm going to do is run you through some of the kind of headline findings for, from this research. Um, so first of all, we know that um, students going to for-profit institutions are more likely to take on debt. Okay. Uh, for undergrads, there are more borrowers, uh, many more borrowers uh, per student at these institutions. Okay. We know that cohort default rates are generally higher. So 16% of for-profit borrowers um, default uh, three years after repayment starts versus 7% at a private nonprofit or 10% at public institutions. Okay. And we know that repayment of loans tends to be slower for uh, students who leave for-profit schools. So for degree completers, okay, uh, they had paid back 43% of loans after five years um, versus 67% uh, for completers at all types of institutions. And repayment is lower, of course, for the non-completers. Okay. And for the the reason why we get these worse outcomes appears to be because of worse labor market outcomes associated with these for-profit schools. Okay, so um, we know that uh, students are less likely to graduate from the for-profit schools. Uh, about a quarter um, of the students at four-year for-profits graduate within six years versus 57% at all four-year institutions. We know they have lower median earnings, higher unemployment rates than for students at other types of higher ed institutions. Now, you're probably saying, wait a minute, you know, you just told me that these students come from more disadvantaged backgrounds, so don't we expect this? And the, the answer is, yeah, you do expect it to some extent, but there have been other studies that are doing um, kind of controlling for the more disadvantaged backgrounds of uh, for-profit students. Um, and these studies also conclude that the outcomes are, um, in terms of the labor market, are not as good. So there's this Leamy and Turner study that shows that uh, students uh, graduating for for profits are less likely to be employed, have lower earnings. Uh, there's another study showing they have more loans, higher loan amounts, uh, worse labor market outcomes. Um, so these are all the kind of, uh, these new studies all kind of control for the more disadvantaged background. And they're more getting at this um, question of kind of how much value added and how does it compare with other types of institutions. Um, let's see, one final point about for-profits is that this rise in for-profits and the problems associated with for-profits, it didn't occur randomly, okay? Um, it actually appears to be associated with relaxation of, of lending rules. There are basically cycles of um, federal rules that govern the student loan program. I'm not going to go into this at depth, but um, they basically rules, I'm actually going to talk about them later in, the in just a couple of minutes, um, but basically uh, there has been research that's looked at kind of a loosening of regulations that occurred uh, in the kind of beginning of this century um, that uh, basically uh, kind of seems to explain the growth in for-profits. Uh, this is just a list of changes in federal regulations. When you get the deck, you can go back and look at it. Um, I'm going to go uh, kind of quickly through the last two concerns so I can get on to student loan policy. Um, another issue of concern is basically the rise in high balance borrowers. This graph is showing you in blue uh, students who have modest amounts of student debt, less than 25000 They account for two-thirds of borrowers. Um, but you can see in black, you can see um, that uh, 
about one eighth of borrowers who owed more than 50,000 in 2014, they accounted for half of aggregate balances. This chart just shows you kind of that there has been growth in uh, high balance loans over time. Okay. Uh, you're probably thinking, wait, wait a second, don't those high balance borrowers, aren't those doctors and lawyers who earn more? Yes, they do earn, they do generally have higher earnings than low balance borrowers. Um, but there has been kind of growth in uh, kind of categories of concern. We're seeing more high bal balance borrowers who are kind of parent plus borrowers. We're seeing more high balance borrowers who are borrowing to attend a for profit institution. Okay, the last point I want to make about high balance borrowers is that um, they, they tend to earn more income, so they're less likely to default, okay? But uh, they dis because they borrow so much, they disproportionately account for the dollars in default. And that's what these uh, kind of higher light blue lines on this chart are showing you. Last concern is large and growing racial disparities in student loans. Um, just have some... Um, panels here from research that is showing you kind of differences across households and different racial groups. But what you can see here is black bar. You can see that they're kind of uh, the light blue bars are for 1993. The dark blue bars are for 2008. You can see there's been a rise of student loans for all groups. But you can see the increases are kind of larger for black bars. And generally, the bars are higher for black bars in terms of the amount of debt they have. Um, the average debt they have four years after graduation, okay, and students who owed more than they borrowed. So these are people who are in, uh, kind of not repaying their loans, in fact, accumulating more debt over time, okay. Uh, I'm going to skip over this slide, but um, it's just uh, making the point that some of it does have to do with for-profit institutions. Turns out that in terms of uh, black students barring to go to graduate schools, they're more likely than white students to attend a for-profit institution. Okay, uh, and the last one I want to make about uh, uh, kind of uh, minority borrowers is that there's a higher share of um, these these large parent plus program loans that are problematic for black borrowers. In this graph, it's a really important graph. It's showing you uh, for black borrowers and white borrowers uh, how, what share is represented by um, different categories of effective family contribution, um, which is kind of when you do a student loan application, your, your contribution is uh, how much you can, uh, your expected contribution is how much you can afford to play, pay. So the point here is just that this lightest blue segment of the bar is for families that are deemed um, un unable to afford to pay any of the college education. Um, they represent about a third of parent plus borrowers. So real questions about why the program is giving out loans to uh, families that have been deemed unable to, to finance any of college. So they're going to have trouble paying back these loans. Okay. So. I want to spend the last few minutes of the talk on uh, kind of the question of how we can improve uh, student loan policy. We have different types of government policies uh, to uh, kind of um, uh, improve uh, the situation for student borrowers. Uh, some of these policies are aimed at relieving struggling student borrowers, people who can't make their payments. Some are designed to impose accountability on higher ed institutions. Um, and some are kind of somewhere in between. So one thing that I worked on uh, when I was in the, at the Treasury Department was the College Scorecard, which is uh, this uh, nice um, kind of website you can go to, I recommend you go to, that provides uh, kind of all this information about different institutions in terms of how much it costs to go, how much students tend to borrow, what earnings are after you leave the school, uh, what graduation rates are. So uh, that can help students make better uh, decisions, and it helps impose uh, some accountability on institutions. OK, so in terms of relieving struggling borrowers, the kind of main program we have is the Income Driven Repayment Program that I already discussed. 
Okay. And there is real evidence that these plans do help borrowers avoid default. Okay. But it has its limitations. Okay. The program is administratively burdensome. Borrowers have to recertify. They have to kind of document their hardship. They have to recertify every year uh, that they need uh, to be in this program. Uh, so they need to document their family income, their family size. It's based on uh, previous year's income. So, uh, you know, if you've lost your job, uh, you may not be able to pay your student loan, but it doesn't help you. You may not be able to get into this program if you were earning a bunch kind of in the previous year. So you're not getting the program when you necessarily need it. Uh, and there's some evidence that it gets inconsistently applied across mortgage service, or sorry, student loan servicers. There are ideas to address these limitations in the program. So uh, Sue Dangarski, who's an expert on student loans, for example, has advocated switching to a system of payroll withholding. So it just comes directly out of people's paycheck, which would avoid the need for this cumbersome certification paperwork. Uh, you'd see the payments automatically adjust as your earnings adjust. It would take the loan servicers out of the process. So those could be some real advantages. There are some trade-offs, okay? It would be at the individual level, not the household level. And most cases, when people think about whether they can afford to make a payment or not, you're really thinking about their household income. There's more potential for moral, moral hazard. Uh, it's coming directly out of uh, your paycheck, then it's uh, kind of no longer giving you the choice of how you're going to use uh, your money. So uh, it's basically forcing you to prioritize your loan payments over other uses of the earnings. Okay. There are kind of, uh, kind of more modest steps to improving uh, or overcoming these limitations with the Income Driven Repayment Program. Uh, you know, one thing, for example, that we talked about during the administration was, for example, uh, switching to two-year recertification. So at least you didn't have to do it every year. Um, I, the Income Driven Repayment Program also has some problems when it comes to high balance borrowers, and uh, that has to do with the loan forgiveness in the program. Okay, so high balance borrowers, because of this loan forgiveness, they tend to disproportionately benefit uh, because, uh, you know, as it turns out, uh, you know, they have really big loans. They, weigh, they may well not be able to kind of pay them off, uh, you know, after 20 years, but then they get a whole bunch forgiven. And I'm citing here a link to a kind of blog post written by Adam Looney that was just discussing a kind of case study of an orthodontist who had a bunch of student loans, but still had a decent income uh, in a kind of moderately large home, uh, but was paying only a, a pretty modest amount because of the program and was on track to have a bunch of loan, loans forgiven after 25 years. Okay, not clear how to fix this problem, but limiting the size of these uh, big loans, these grad plus loans, would be a good starting point. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is um, policies to impose accountability, okay? So this is just basically saying kind of what can we do to um, basically get schools to do their job and to provide a good uh, education for, um, the, for the money that people are paying them, okay? What we, we currently do have some accountability in the program. So the school has really high cohort default rates. They risk losing access to the program. Um, schools are also limited to um, no more than 90% of their revenues coming from federal aid. This is known as the 90-10 rule. The idea being that um, like basically unless somebody is willing to put their own money towards your school, it's not uh, maybe a good school, okay? There's a borrower defense rule, which is protections for borrowers who have been defrauded. I've italicized it because that rule is currently, currently being weakened by the current administration. And there's something called the gainful employment rule, uh, which says that schools with systematically high debt to earnings risk, uh, systematically high debt to earnings risk losing access to the student loan program. But that, too, is uh, being weakened. The current administration has announced it will actually rescind the gainful employment rule. Okay. Um, so the evidence suggests these me accountability measures are not enough. I hope that's what you're taking away from my earlier slides. Uh, the, you know, to address that, the first order of business has to be not weakening uh, the borrower defense rule and not rescinding the gainful employment rule. 
Um, I would also consider re reversing some of the relaxation of standards that occurred in the last decade. So for example, in mid-2000s, we allowed fully on online institutions to uh, be part of the student loan program, and it turns out they uh, kind of explained about a third of the rise in defaults. Okay. Um, Another good idea, which I worked on when I was at Treasury, is what's called a risk-sharing program. So um, just let me take you, uh, tell you a little bit about the proposal that we worked on. Uh, and then my colleagues, uh, Tiffany Hsu, Adam Looney, and Tara Watson actually published it a couple of years later. Um, but basically, the idea was you would basically assess schools based on their cohort repayment rate, okay? Not default rate, repayment rate, because as I already told you, that's a better metric, okay? So for schools that weren't doing so well with their repayment rates, you would impose a continuum of penalties depending on how badly the schools perform. Okay, so what essentially you're doing is requiring these poor performing schools to pay back some of the loans that are not being repaid. Okay, so part of the idea, of course, is to protect taxpayers. Okay, if you get these schools to pay back some of the loans, but you're also incentivizing the schools to provide more value added. So there are things that schools can do. They can match students better with programs. They can teach better. They can encourage graduation. They can assist with job placement. Okay. So, uh, you know, and I would say another kind of advantage of this sort of proposal is that instead of a just you're in, you're out, like we have with the current cohort default rule rate measure, uh, there's like a continuum of penalties, which means that, uh, you know, it's harder to game. There's more general incentive to improve, to kind of clean up your act. Um, the central tension with all these accountability measures, the risk sharing as well as everything else, is that the schools that have the worst loan performance are generally the ones that serve the most disadvantaged students. Okay, so you're really, you know, it's a hard question. You're balancing kind of access to credit and economic mobility, uh, you know, with uh, kind of the risks that come with the, the current version of the student loan program. You know, given that, I think it's really important to think about carve-outs or rewards for schools uh, serving low-income students. So that you're not just slamming the schools that have uh, poor outcomes. You're kind of um, slamming the ones that uh, don't have a, a, a good reason for having those poor, poor outcomes. Uh, this is my last slide. And we're out of time right now, but I just couldn't uh, kind of leave the topic without making some mention of proposals to forgive student debt because they're in the news now. Uh, there is, I should say, there is already some forgiveness in the student loan program. I, I told you it was already built into the income driven repayment program. Um, but Senator Warren, Senator Sanders, uh, Sanders, I'm sure other candidates will come out with um, kind of proposals to forgive existing students. Uh, debt, uh, I think we're likely to hear more about this as the 2020 campaign heats up, and I think it's entirely understandable, given that some people have been ill-served by the program. Um, I'm not going to kind of go into depth on this issue. I will just say that there are really hard questions uh, that we need to kind of wrestle with as we think about this issue. Uh, forgiving student debt is its really uh, expensive, and, uh, you know, if you forgive uh, you know, they, these plans tend to be uh, regressive since it's the higher earners who have more debt. Um, you know, so the real question is how you make sure the money goes to the truly needy. Uh, there are questions about how you avoid moral hazard. Uh, there are all sorts of issues to wrestle with. Okay, so um, thank you for listening to me. Uh, that's all I have, but I'd be delighted to take questions. Okay, thank you so much, Karen. That was wonderful. Um, and I just want to remind folks to uh, type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We've got about 10 minutes left, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can before our time's up. Uh, for our first question, we have a question from Darnell, and you know, this kind of references back to uh, your, your work uh, with the college scorecard information, but uh, could you talk about some of the challenges that come in trying to get that information out to maybe folks who are, you know, like the high school education um, or maybe whose families don't have a lot of resources to really help them sort of analyze this information. What did you uh, find as you were working on that? Um, can you tell us anything about that? Sure. So um, we, we did kind of really wrestle with this issue. I, find, I think the college scorecard is just um, wonderful, but it is true that you have to have 
you're probably going to need to have a certain level of sophistication in the first place to know to even look for that information. And again and again, we heard stories about students who, for example, were avoiding kind of the elite institutions. They were high, ta they were talented students. They were avoiding the elite institutions because they didn't understand that those institutions actually provide more financial aid in some cases than um, uh, you know a public institution. So. Uh, we wrestled with it, um, but I certainly think there's more to be done. I know that there are um, kind of individual uh, academics who have been interested in kind of creating apps to try to get the information out. Uh, there's been uh, some work done trying to kind of just send uh, kind of mailings out to high school students to, that have kind of very kind of simple explanation of some of these points. But I think it is a challenge. Okay. Um, earlier, you referenced a couple of studies, kind of looking at uh, this this concern that maybe millennials are kind of holding back on some of these traditional processes that because of their student loan debt. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit more about sort of your view on that, and uh, you know, like what what do you see actually going on there? Um, well, so um, there has been some academic research that I mentioned. Um, it's not always easy to interpret, and people are getting kind of different results. But as best as I can tell from the research, uh, student loans um, do seem to be causing some young adults to delay purchasing um, a home. And that's certainly consistent with anecdotal evidence. Um, so I think it does explain part of the really big declines we've seen in home ownership rates since the financial crisis, which, by the way, have been concentrated in households that are under, you know, are, are under the age of 35 or in the 35 to 44 category. Uh, so I do think it plays some role, but there, are, there are certainly it's not the whole uh, thing by any means. There are other important issues as well, like lack of credit access. Um, the high cost of housing now, maybe a preference of, these, of uh, this generation not to own homes. That's the first point around home ownership. Um, we are seeing um, other trends that I think might be related to student loans, but we just haven't really been able to explore in detail. For example, we have seen um, that young adults, um, and I don't mean kind of college student age or traditional college student age, I mean like in the 25 to 34 age category, they're more likely to be living at home than they used to be. Uh, and, and, and it's trended up uh, kind of over the years, and the trend hasn't really softened uh, you know, with the strengthening of the economy, which I find uh, kind of really interesting. You would think as the economy got stronger, you'd see more students leaving the nest. Um, I think it's probably largely related to the high cost of housing, but again, student loans may be uh, making it harder for people to go off on their own and uh, you know, form their own household. Um, so that's the second point. Um, I guess the third point is just that um, the problems, uh, so we're trying to figure out what the problems are right now, but I think you know, the problems are going to take, the, the full extent of the problems are probably going to take years, if not decades, to fully emerge. Um, it might take a really long time before we kind of fully understand kind of how these student loans are affecting people. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Lars about uh, specifically about why uh, about your recommendation of possibly limiting the size of grad plus loans. Um, and he uses the example of, you know, like, are, are the downsides of this for possibly for maybe attorneys working in legal aid or just other people who are maybe, um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, do work that may be limiting their earning capacity initially. Uh, what, do, what do you have to say about that? So this is the, the trade-offs associated with limiting the grad plus loans. Is that the right, question? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so this is. I mean, this is this is kind of. It's a really hard <laughs> issue, um, uh, because I mean, as of all student loan issues, because you're kind of looking for uh, kind of ways to kind of keep people from becoming over indebted, but. Uh, inevitably, by kind of restricting credit access, there are going to be some people who really needed the credit uh, who are going to be hurt by this. And I should say it's not unique to the student loan market. This is, as I worked on mortgage policy in the last administration, this is always a question of mortgage policy as well. Um, I think the idea is that there certainly is um, kind of anecdotal evidence that uh, we are seeing kind of some schools charge tuitions 
that are basically higher than maybe they would, uh, would be if not for uh, uh, kind of this grad uh, plus program and uh, kind of this loan for forgiveness that, it, that occurs after a certain amount of, of time. Um, so um, there's anecdotal evidence that, you know, there's some programs for fields that don't pay much, that don't pay really high salaries like social work. Uh, you know, where you have, you pay a, a pretty high tuition to attend those programs, and those are, that's really where the concerns are. But it's a hard question. We have a question from Jim about sort of mixed portfolios between um, public and private loans, and and how uh, has there been a lot of work that sort of deals with like how to uh, make both of those things work? Because a lot of these programs would probably uh, mostly impact folks' uh, federal loans. Um, but is, is, there, is there a way to kind of incorporate uh, the private loans they have in, in these reforms? Yeah, so um, private loans in general uh, are going to be, or at least for, for someone who's starting school, private loans are going to be uh, uh, more expensive because these are basically kind of unsecured loans. You're just borrowing against their future income. Um, so, and they're not going to have the kind of protections that the federal program have. So, uh, for that reason, I think the the federal program is probably the, the better starting place for people. Um, now, a question I get a lot is, uh, well, you know, someone graduates having taken out uh, a bunch of kind of federal loans, but then they get approached by a private lender uh, with an offer to refinance their loans. Um, and there I can say that um, uh, you need to be very careful. Uh, you can kind of sign away a lot of your federal protections if you move over to a private loan. But there are cases where a private loan may be uh, kind of a better deal for you. Uh, and basically what the private lenders are doing is they can kind of cherry pick. They can find, they can look at a student and see where they got their degree and see kind of how much income they're now earning and say, wow, that person's a really good risk to lend to. Uh, so I'm going to kind of offer them a lower interest rate than the federal program offers them. Uh, you know, if you're in that situation personally, it may be a good deal to uh, refinance into that private loan. Not great news for our federal program, of course, because it's the uh, people who are have the ability to pay who subsidize the people who uh, have payment problems. Uh, so if you cherry pick out all the kind of people with good credit, uh, it's going to be costly to the to the program. We have uh, we have a number of questions from folks. Um, kind of ranging from talking about free college to just uh, like look, keeping education costs low and, and sort of how do the, that sort of range of options, you know, like uh, fit into this here. I mean, do you, do you have any sort of broader points about that? About keeping costs of education? Uh, yeah, I mean, like how, you know, what can yeah. be done there that, that fits into this Yeah, picture? I mean, so these are all really hard uh, issues. Um, just when it comes to the, you know, cost of higher ed, uh, you know, the one thing I have to say is that, uh, um, you know, I think, I think there's this view that, oh, you know, if the government gives a loan to someone, that's going to be less costly to the taxpayer because, you know, it's a loan and they'll get paid back. But, you know, if you've got, if you're in a situation where so many loans are not being paid back, you really have to ask whether, uh, you know, it would have been better to just give out the money as, as grants in the first place. Um, I guess, you know, if one thing, uh, you know, we talked about a lot in the, when I was in the administration was uh, making community college free. Uh, I think that's a kind of terrific uh, kind of starting point. Um, community college is, of course, uh, very low cost now, uh, but it seems to deliver um, kind of good value to a lot of students. Um, you know, uh, it, it's not a, this would not be a panacea because uh, there's some students who need something different than community college, uh, but it certainly would be a good starting point. Okay. So we are uh, essentially out of time, uh, Karen, but I just want to thank you so much for this. But um, before I, I let everyone go, uh, do you have kind of a wrap-up thought for us? You know, what should we lo be looking at going forward? Uh, you know, you referenced some of this coming up in the incoming, uh, upcoming presidential election. Just 
Um, what, what's on your radar uh, that you can tell us about? Well, I just, um, I think that uh, the, you know, in, given the, the kind of trends in the economy um, in, over the last few decades where we've seen uh, growing inequality and limited income growth for people in the middle and lower part of the income distribution, that um, access to higher education just has to be um, uh, an important issue, an important policy priority and um, I think it's something we need to be thinking about. Uh, we should view it as uh, kind of an investment uh, in both these people, but uh, kind of in our country as a whole, and we really need to kind of find ways to make it more accessible to more people.